Well, welcome back to my YouTube channel, Mispronounced Adventures, and it's an upgraded video, and it's going to be an electrical one. Um, I've got a cabinet full of blue, and I want more blue. So I'm going to be installing a second Victron battery-to-battery -battery charger. So I'm going to be running two 30-amp isolated uh, Victron B2Bs in parallel. So running two Victron battery battery chargers in parallel isn't anything new, but I haven't seen that many videos on actually how to install it or implement it. Additionally, my original install, my first uh, Victron battery battery charger is my one of my most popular videos, and I think it's around 40,000 views on my channel, which is a lot more than most of my things. So I thought I'd make another video on it. The main reason I want uh, to upgrade or to have more charging options is not because I need it, it, but I would like it. When I was up in northern Norway and northern Sweden, we had pretty much no solar, and even the, the single 30 amp battery battery charger was keeping my batteries topped up just fine. I'm quite a heavy user for electrics. I've got an induction stove, an air fryer, I've uh, got my Xbox, and I'm a heavy user for electrics. Um, it's not so much that I need it, but I want to be able to recharge fast. It'd be nice if I, opposed to having to do two hours of driving a day to charge up the batteries when there's no solar, be able to only do one. So that's my main reason for fitting it. Additionally, out there, there are a few of the competitors like Renogy do make larger battery to battery chargers like 50 amp uh, or plus. Same with Sterling. Uh, Victor and Sorley make 30 amp ones, so that's why I'm going to go for two of their units in parallel. So I've gone for the isolated charger. You could also get the non isolated charger, which will have a common ground opposed to um, a isolated in and out like mine. Generally, for uh, vans and camp vans, this makes no difference. I just happened to go for the isolated versions originally, but this install isn't really going to be much different. Uh, the only change would be if you had the non-isolated one, you would, wouldn't have to run a negative wire from the front. So I'm going to run 50 mil squared cable to the front of the van. 50 mil squared for this application, it's not because the amount of amps I'm going to be drawing. It's probably going to be drawing from the front around... 65 to 70 amps the reason it's going such a thick gauge uh, is the voltage drop uh, at the minute i run 16 for the one and there's not too much voltage drop however there the cable does get a bit warm and i happen to have two rolls of five meter 50 mil so i'm going to run that uh, to the front logistically that's going to be a pain in the arm so another thing to consider is i'm going to be fitting two 30 amp battery battery chargers uh, that doesn't mean it's going to draw 30 amps per charger or 60 amps in total. I actually find that my single 30 amp charger at the minute, if I put an amp clamp on the cable from the starter uh, battery and the alternator, it draws about 33 to 34 amps. So I'm expecting to get a 60 amp output from these. It should be drawing around 65 to 70 amps uh, from my alternator. Uh, my van has a 220 amp um, alternator, which is reasonably high powered. Whilst I don't know the exact specifications on what sort of size uh, you should be having, I think I did see, but don't quote me, somewhere recommending at least a 180 amp alternator if you plan to be putting like about a 60 amp load on it. So if you are considering this, please check what the specifications of your alternator are. Um, with alternators, they produce dis different amounts of uh, different well different amounts of power at different revolutions of the uh, uh, of the engine. So when they're idling, they're producing um, a lot less power than if you were driving at two or 3,000 revs. Because of that, if you're trying to pull a larger load off the alternator, uh, whilst it's spinning slowly uh, at idling revolution, it's gonna get hot because alternators are also cooled by themselves spinning. So that's a consideration. However, looking at the spec chart for my alternator, uh, even at idling revolutions, it still should still be producing the amps required to run these charges. So on the transit, uh, you've got a CCP or a customer connection point, And I recently made a video about upgrading this. My transit had the original one stud, which has a 60 amp fuse behind it. And some of the transits come with three studs, which are each individually fused to 60 amp. Um, this is my old battery battery charger, so I'm going to run the new one. Uh, I'm going to parallel all three of these together uh, to go to a mega fuse of about 100 amps, which then I'm going to attach 50 mil cable, which is then going to run to the back of the van. Whilst I'm having two battery battery chargers, which are 30 amps each to 60 amp, as I said earlier, one of these studs is, is um, fused to each of these is fused to 60 amps, but a 60 amps worth of battery battery charging will probably draw around 65. To 70 amps which would blow one of these so i'm going to run all three of them in parallel so none of them are working particularly hard uh, and my issue is i need to figure out how to get the cable through the shower room to the back of the van because someone didn't build a cable way 
on this side of the van. But how I'm running the cables isn't really relevant for anyone else's van build, so I'm gonna just do that. It's gonna take a couple hours, I think, to get all the cable there, and then when it's in the electrical cupboard, then I'll continue the video on actually the wiring up and the rest of it. Right, let's have a look. So, big 50 mil cables are currently run. In that little slot down there, which I'll be tidying up, but runs underneath the shower room, all the way through the van, underneath all these cabinets. And the minute cabinets come out there, and then it will go into the back of the electrical cupboard. Right, because rewiring everything is obviously loads of fun. Uh, I'm gonna mount this panel on the door here, like so, and then I think what we're gonna do is we're gonna move this, take this out, move it onto the door. We're gonna have its new sibling directly next to it, which means I've got all the space underneath to do the wiring. And then we're gonna move this box up to here. So when the door closes, it's got space here. I'm also gonna have to move the solar isolator, but there's space back here, so I can just move it back a little bit. I'm gonna have, yeah have these two boxes going to be mounted on the door. I'm going to put some fans underneath. That's going to be a different video. And then we can have all the big cables coming in here, the fuses, split it into the fuses, blah, 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 back onto there. So yeah, rewiring the entire cabinet. Board painted and made. Two little extra supports on the back just so I can put some slightly thicker screws through in different places. That's the inside frame of the cabinet. So two heat plates because these aren't meant to be mounted on flammable materials. So I'm just going to put some base plates beneath them. Battery to battery chargers on the top. And this isn't part of this video, um, but I'm also making some coolers for them it's gonna be a whole video on this but quick information uh, these are 30 amp chargers at 12 volt however they thermal throttle themselves after 40 degrees and being passively cooled they often get too hot so I often see mine not outputting the 360 watt they're meant to um, outputting around 300 watt because they've got too hot even in the ventilated cabinet but a lot of people don't know that these units are three are 30 amp or 360 watt at 40 degrees in the manual, but the manual also says it will do a continuous output of up to 430 watt if they're at 25 degrees. So the hotter they get, the lower the output, but also the, cold, the cooler they are, the higher the output. So you can get them to supply more than 30 amp. Uh, and that's the idea of this. So I'm gonna mount this. I'm gonna make, get some 3D printed ducting to go between there so it cools it all off and that's gonna be a separate video testing that and see how effective or ineffective it is but they're gonna get mounted on there for now because I want everything mounted and I forgot to press record but these are all screwed down now so just mocking together my rudimentary sort of wiring run the ducting can go underneath these but the minute what's going to happen is we're going to have all the wires come out of there snake that way down there across in that way and same on this one together then we can have the fuses for the individual positives on all of those so four um fuses there the negatives come together and then they can make their way off the door into the electrical cupboard where the big wires will be coming to feed in now it's time to get this assembled prep paint router and just make it all look kind of pretty. A few hours later, parts dry so the ducting can go in, it can be hidden underneath there and then the wire run on top. We're gonna have the wires come down and that way. Right, it's a few days later and the components I want are all here. So particularly what I needed were for these fuse boxes. So on this board, there's gonna be eight different cables. Uh, all the positives of these need to be fused, so the positives going into the unit needs to be fused and the positives coming out of the unit needs to be fused. And the other thing I needed to figure out was I needed to turn the 50mm cable into two 16mm. 
and you can buy uh, like stu individual studs of posts but they were about eight pounds for a stud and then the protective cover to cover the ex exposed um, terminal was another eight pounds about 16 17 pounds per connection and I needed to do four of them but instead I bought mega fuse holders which are an M8 stud um, so I'm just going to put a 100 amp fuse in the middle and use 50 mil on one side and then the 260 mils coming out so there the actual fuse itself isn't particularly important because I've got it fused at the source and it's gonna be fused in these two lines I'm just gonna use the uh, mega fuse holder as effectively a small bus bar because this was six pound versus 16 to 17 pounds to do it correctly uh, and on the negative cables I'm gonna do the same I'm just gonna take one of the bolts and pins out and just stack the 50 mil and the two 16 mils on one and then put the case back on Additionally, it's going to be quite neat in the cupboard because these are all stackable like so, so I can just have the five, the four big 50mm uh, cables going in and then two or eight in total 16mm coming out on the cupboard would then enter the board and then go up to the appropriate um, area. I think that's going to be a cheaper solution than buying all individual posts and studs. So let's get wiring this all up. So I'm going to use 16 mil squared cable. The important thing to remember doing this part is because I want to use the automatic engine detection and I want these Jimmy work at the same time, I'm going to keep the cable lengths between them the same. So the cable lengths are all going to be the same down the 50 mil, and then when it splits from the 50 mil, into the two 16s, one for each charger. I'm going to keep those uh, as the same, the same length. Additionally, I'm going to probably end up doing the same on the positives and then the same for the negatives. So I'm going to have to do a cable run down here, and down here, and probably have them joining together somewhere around here, and keeping all of these cables the same length. with the wiring last night and did most of that it works okay but not amazing so I think all I'm gonna do is undo all these cable ties and this wrap and then I'm gonna try with p-clips this time and p-clip it there p-clip it there I quite like the look I think it looks good uh, but it could be a bit neater so time to undo all of that and try it again Right, after long last and many cable ties. I'm not particularly worried about the stress on this joint because there's not really much flex going on and this is all free floating as well. That and as I said before, these are cables for flexing. They're flexible cables. It's in the electrical cupboard so the door's gonna get open very rarely. So it's not too much of an issue. I will add that 60 more cable for this section, massively overkill and probably a pain in the ass. 10 mil squared or even less would have been fine, but because I was replacing all the 16 mil, which was running the length of the van, I had loads spare and loads of lugs. So I might as well get it all used up. Um, but yeah, 16 mil squared cable, way, way overkill, but there's no negatives in using um, oversized cable. It just um, either costs more and is physically more to manage. These I'll never have to worry about. Thought we'd drop. <laughs> right, time to start getting things connected. So these cables are all made. Uh, this is going to be the ignition wire which triggers the fans. And then I've also got to put two other wires on the back of these 
which are the trickle charger, which keeps the start battery trickly charged. So, door pretty much finished, apart from the on switches for the battery chargers. Next is I need to get all this excess cable moved down the van so I can then do the very end cables at the right length. Right, currently squashed behind my chair, that's where the cables come out, so I'm going to run cables up here into the fuse box sitting there so I have easy access to it. That misses my sliding door, which is this when it's closed, and then at those we'll go into the CCP point on that on the uh, driver door pillar, base even. And the negative is going to run up the same way through here and then onto this stud here, which is the battery negative terminal after the um, some of the, the kit Ford have on it. So there are probably other ground points around. Might as well go for the stud, which is what I've used in the past as well. Right, time to get this off and get the final bits made. Camera angles are a pain here, but three equal length cables. We're going to go on the fuse and then round the corner to the CCT point, which I'll show you. Right, that's the all three of the customer connection point bits connected. Then goes into the fuse box, which then snakes back round underneath here. So we cable tie these all together and do some wire management and get the case back on the uh, battery. It's been a little while and almost everything is now wired up. Just these, which are the remote pins. So I use the uh, the isolated on off switch um, because I've got a relay set up from the BMV that if the batteries get too cold it cuts the relay which then stops these from turning on. It's basically a cold weather um, low temperature charging safety. So I think all that's left to do is turn the engine on uh, and see what happens. Because it's air plugged in these are powered at the minute you can see the flashing so I've logged into the new one and I've set all the charge parameters to be the exact same as my old one and the names and stuff. So we're gonna turn it on first just to make sure that this system works and then turn it off and then get ready to actually properly test it. So as for the software side and setting up in the app, all you need to do, in my case, I've renamed it, changed the default Bluetooth password as you should always do. And I've just copied across uh, my settings from my original Victron V2B to my, my new B2B. That's all you really need to do. There's nothing to set up uh, them running in parallel. These devices do not connect to VE Direct. So there's no communication between this and the rest of the VicStrong system or the devices. Um, it's just them looking at the system voltage and how fast um, the leisure system voltage is rising for it to make its charge profiles. Um, but because both the units have the same wiring and the same lengths and the same resistance and they're going to be reading the same voltages, uh, that's absolutely fine. Additionally, I've had no issues using the automatic engine detection, uh, which is what I normally use uh, with two units. They seem to be working perfectly and both unit. The hell is going on here? They both seem to be working well uh, and turning off with the engine off and turning on with the engine on. However, I am going to show you something I am going to do. So today's project before I put it away has been wiring in this switch. So at the moment it's wired in that if I hit the top button then you just have one B2B on and if you have the bottom button two B2Bs on and that's just going to go in the, one of the Ford's original slots. The way that's done is using a dual pole switch effectively the on signal is going to the center and then you've got just on one pole, one of them, and then on the two, you've got both. The wiring diagram will make more sense than that. The 12 volt signal wire runs through the Victron at BMV's relay, and the relay will open and close depending on the temperature of the battery. So if the batteries are too cold, then the relay is open, and that stops any signal getting through to the chargers, uh, preventing them to turn on in a cold temperature scenario, where it might damage the lithium batteries if they were charged. For example, I've got to get it on one switch. Then back here at the minute, the left hand unit is turned on and the left hand fan is turned on. And that signal is goes to a reload which controls the fan. 
never hit both of them. Both fans run will have it in the middle of the position and then will run. The reason I might want something like this is generally in the winter I am going to want both of these on but in the summer I'm going to have so much solar that I might choose to have the battery to battery chargers off or even um, just one of them on. So let's get this back into normal position and wrap it up for the day. So with my engine started at the minute we should see the units are just booting up and we'll be able to see how many amps are drawn. There we go. Currently drawing 70 amps. Oh, this will go up to about 79 amps. There we go. That's both units currently running at max in bulk mode and are drawing 79 amps, including two amps for the fans I use for cooling them. Let me pop to the back. We connect it to this one. That's currently charging at 68 amps. So that's 68 amps charging from these two 30 amp chargers. Because they're currently on startup mode, uh, after they begin to overheat, you would generally see them drop quite a lot. Uh, because I have my active cooling on, uh, I actually maintain about, even after two or three hours, I will maintain a 65 amp charge. Here's, um, after some testing for another video, uh, here's a look at my alternator after half an hour under thermal. As you can see, it's only around 70 degrees, which from speaking to people, uh, that is an acceptable temperature for these units to work at. And looking at the Ford spec sheet, it shows uh, that these units working well up to about 104 degrees. Um, so I'm fine with that. And that's also a 30 minute, from a 30 minute test, which is the van idling. So the worst possible cooling because it's a, it's low revolution to the engine. So low cooling of the, of the unit and maximum power coming off it. So that's going to end this video. And what I would want you to take away from it is as long as you've alternated up to giving the job, it's no real problem adding two battery to battery chargers. Consider the wiring if you're going to use the engine detection. I made sure that all my wiring was equal. So both units were reading the exact same voltages from the van's, um, a van's electric side. Uh, also that if you want to add a switch like I have, you can do it that way. Um, but what I think will be really interesting is if you check out my thermal testing video and I'll show you how I've achieved about 25% increased performance output, far above the um, 30 amp output on these units from long term use using some cooling. So that's going to be it for this video. And once again, thank you very much for joining me. Feel free to just like and subscribe and uh, I'll see you next time. Cheers. Bye.